Um, cool. Yeah, so next is, so as the data panel has mentioned, gaming is another thing that um, the blockchain has always been closely associated with. So now we're going to have Michael from Exterial, um, as well as two more um, of our portfolios, the so Space and Time co-founder, Jerome, as well as Andy. Uh, let me start. Um, hi, my name is Michael, uh, and my company is Exterio. Uh, I have been in the industry for about 20 years and uh, working on different kind of games in publishing and research and development as well. Uh, besides me is Jerome, um, who is the founder of Space Nation. <laughs> and uh, he is also has been in the industry for a very long time. Uh, and then, and then beside him is Mohammed, uh, who is the head of tokenomics in Animoca Brands. And I think he, I also know that he's a mathematician. <laughs> so yeah, we, ha we can ask him a lot of uh, math uh, questions. Yeah, but um, maybe I will let uh, Jerome to, to tell, tell us a little bit more about Space Nation and then have Mohammed to tell us a bit more about uh, the, some of the projects that he's working on. Um, hi everyone, it's uh, Jerome Wu, uh, co-founder and the CEO of uh, Space Nation. Space Nation is a Web3 space opera MMORPG. So we, uh, we are trying to like, leverage Web3 technologies and the tools to empower a lot of aspects, specifically in MMORPG, including like, um, to empower the uh, production relationship, to reinforce the uh, uh, social connection, and more importantly, to improve the production, uh, the, the economic cycle. So we believe that uh, by doing uh, leveraging the Web3 text and tools properly, we're able to create much stronger and much stabler uh, economy in the Web3 MMRPG than it could have been done in Web2. And that's why, uh, that's what our team like strongly believe, and that's why we all in this industry. Hello everyone, I'm Mohamed Azuddin, the head of tokenomics at Animocra Brands. It's great to be here. Uh, Animocra Brands really at the heart of our philosophy is the open metaverse, is digital ownership, or ownership of our digital rights. And really it's a big focus on changing the end user into an active participant within an ecosystem and how we can move away from zero-sum games into positive network effects and how we can really grow the industry one step at a time and leveraging the power of our ecosystem. And for myself, uh, Exterio is a platform for gamers and also for developers. Uh, we build different kind of SDK to have a more less friction for the gamers and easier for the developers to build their games. We are also an incubator for games. Uh, we have four games uh, being incubated right now. Uh, one is a strategy game called Age of Dinos, and another one is a first-person shooter called Triple T, and then another one is a RPG game called Overworld, and then the last one is a kind of an AI pet game is called Palio. Um, may I ask the first question to Mohammed? Uh, there has been a lot of uh, good Web3 games before, and, uh, but you know, they seem to be very difficult to sustain uh, because of the tokenomic design. Uh, after two years now, you know, after Axie Infinity, it's almost two years now, right? And uh, how do you think that uh, tokenomics can be designed so that it can be more sustainable? I think it's, it's a great question, and the, it, Axie really was the birth of this idea of play to earn, which is given birth to play to own and so on and so forth. But really when Axie came about, if we take that as the birthplace of, of Web3 gaming, it was a brand new idea. There were no previous blueprints and there was lots and lots of learning from that. Fast forward to today and I think, especially in the bear market, what we've realized is that there are no Web3 gamers the, the, or the majority of Web3 gamers are speculators. So when we're designing these games and experiences, what we really should be building for is Web2 gamers. And that's where the, the pivot really happens. There's a lot of negativity around NFTs, fungible tokens, just through bad experiences from gamers and what, and what they've heard or experienced in the last couple of years. So fundamentally from a gaming aspect, 
the front end really has to focus on onboarding gamers in a conventional sense. Maybe at the beginning, not including NFTs, not including fungible tokens. And as you start to build up the community around the game, then you can introduce them to NFTs maybe as a first point. And really having a clear bifurcation between the front end, which is a game, which is fun to play, which is aimed at your traditional or Web2 gamers. And as they start to embrace what embrace the game that they're playing, then they can discover NFTs. It really, when we think about incentives in the space, we, we have the idea of incentives the wrong way around. We think incentives is just money. And fundamentally, incentives is so much more than money. There's so much more value out there. The majority of gamers, when they come into a game ecosystem, it's for two main reasons, in my opinion. Number one, the game is fun to play. And number two, they have a lot of their friends or a lot of their community in that ecosystem playing that game already. No mention of money, no mention of incentives. And it, that they're the motivations that inspire people to come in and play these games. And it's very similar when we want someone to go through the, the many different friction points that exist in Web3 to open up a wallet, to then maybe go KYC on an exchange, buy some Ethereum, bridge it to Polygon, buy a token or NFT. It's too complex. And if you're asking someone to do that, to enter a game ecosystem, we have a really big drop-off rate. And that's what we're seeing now, especially in the bear market. So fundamentally, as opposed to that being an incentive, it has to turn into a motivation. Where that motivation is I come into a game, I play, I might unlock a high value in-game item, which doubles up as an NFT. And now that I have this high value item, I'm motivated to go through those friction points and enter the Web3 space or transition from Web2 into Web3 to join the ecosystem and really have a better understanding of how to leverage the technology. So again, a big change from where we were two years ago to where we are today. And we have a number of our titles doing that. So we have a, one of our titles, mobile game, Crazy Defense Heroes, Web2 mobile game, and then we have a meta game on the Web3 side. And then via the game, you start to filter people through from the Web2 side of things into Web3. And it really gives us good metrics as well in terms of what does conversion look like, not just from a Web2 standpoint, but taking them from Web2 on their journey into Web3. Thank you very much, Mahat. I think we all agree to that. Yeah, and I think, actually think the problem is um, those kind of non-sustainable tokenomics is uh, replaced by meme coins. <laughs> <laughs> that, I think that is the problem. I think there is still a big market for that, or big demand from the, some of the users. But uh, why don't I just buy a meme coin, right? <laughs> yeah. So, how, how about uh, Jerome? Do you agree to that? And how is uh, Space Nation's tokenomic design uh, maybe similar to what Mohammed has mentioned? Yeah, we also have like two fundamental rules when we design our whole game, not just the tokenomics. So rule number one, gameplay first. Rule number two, actually is uh, maximize the stability and the sustainability. In our team's view, um, the stability and the sustainability of a Web3 game is actually more important than a Web2 game. Um, this is based on our, um, our personal uh, experience of managing and developing MMRPG for decades. So I personally was uh, people who launched the World of Warcraft in China in, back in 2005 and managed the game for more than 10 years, served the 100 million of the users together with the Nine and with NetEase. And I was also lucky enough to be able to work with the uh, best, web, web, uh, best MMO team in Western, which is uh, Team 2 in Blizzard, and also the, to learn from the best MMO team from NetEase and to get to know like what is really important in MMRPG. So um, in our game, we actually, well, I mean, we are very proud of to say that our game's tokenomic design and the NFT design and even the governance design are completely unique on the, on the market. Uh, there's a few things that I want just to quickly mention about. One, we completely separated the uh, governance token with the uh, in-game currency. Uh, we completely separate them and make sure the uh, in-game currency is well established and, and well protected. And number two, we actually do all our best and we actually made a lot of trade-off to make sure the in-game currency be extremely stable and the in-game ecosystem is being uh, stable and sustainable uh, as possible. As possible. Um, 
So based on that, we designed the whole ecosystem. And yeah, I, I really have a lot of things I want to say and I want to discuss. It's because of the because the king is here, and I hope that uh, after the show I can have a private conversation and it goes through all the details. Yes. Thank you very much, Jerome. Um, well, for Exterio ourselves, is uh, uh, we have different kind of games, and for different kind of games, we also have uh, different kind of tokenomic design. Um, but I think we also follow the rules that uh, both Mohat and Jerome has mentioned. First rule is that it has to be a fun game. Uh, for example, that uh, you know, in TTT is a very fun first-person shooters, uh, and the gameplay is going to be very innovative compared to all the other first-person shooters in the past. Uh, while in uh, another game called Age of Dino, which is a strategy game, um, uh, which is, has a tokenomics that uh, very much like other multiplayer games. So in multiplayer games, we usually set different kind of uses. There is the free players, there is the players who spend a little bit of money just for the sake of getting you know higher ranking, and there are a lot of users who pay a lot of money uh, purely for winning you know, all the lands and conquer all the kingdoms and so on and so forth. But in Web3, the more difficult thing is we actually have to add in one more layer who are the players who want to earn money. But it's the same principle. If you want to earn money, you got to do something, right? And so how we design that the user need to contribute to the community or contribute to the game is a question that how much they can earn. And I think that's the part of the design to make it more sustainable. And um, my next question is going to be uh, a little bit on, on AI. Um, so uh, AI has been a hot topic recently. And um, uh, you know because of ChatGPT, because of MidJourney, um, Maybe I can ask Jerome first, uh, how would uh, AI be uh, incorporated into some of your game, uh, maybe gameplay or so on? Maybe you can share a little bit. Um, our team has been leverage, I mean, use, uh, leveraging AI to do some work for quite a long time, but we haven't disclosed any details. And because we believe that with a new technology, as a game developer, you should always think about how you leverage the new technology to, Im to, to empower the game design or improve the game experience. Other than that, it's not like it really um, creating a significant value. So what we are trying to do right now, I mean, it's already in development. We are doing a, very, uh, doing a stealth mode of a project, uh, creating an AI GC empowered gameplay and this is being like internally developed and you will be internally tested in October. If we pass our internal test, we will probably push it live for uh, external testing in November. Um, but I mean, uh, as of today, I, I don't have too much can be shared. Otherwise, I will be killed by the team. Um, but um, uh, I, I think my, 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 uh, my personal view is always think about, always think about uh, how to leverage a new technology to to, to uh, empower the game design or improve the gameplay. Yeah, and I think just to follow on from what Jerome was saying, there are so many different applications of AI, if it's towards gaming, if it's towards data, and we're still at the beginning of, of some of those journeys, and really maybe two or three things I can talk about is when in a, one of our titles, Life Beyond, when they're generating the landscape, it's leveraging AI, so for example, there's a mountain that's generated, there may be a river that's nearby, and then you, you get the different animals that are close by to there, and if you remove the mountain, then it has a knock-on effect onto what's going on. Um, another application, especially when it comes to in-game items like skins, these skins look different depending on the type of character they're being attached to. If you're having to do this manually, it takes a long time and it's very cost-intensive as well, and AI tends to solve those problems. And then when it comes to actually the player profiling or persona profiling, leveraging AI to have more accurate persona, personas that come out so you can understand how they're interacting with that game environment and how you can really optimize their experience within the game. 
And for ourselves, for Exterior, that we are also working on an AI engine uh, because we feel that the current AI uh, applications or, you know, or, or, or programs uh, has been very robotic. Um, so I think we are improving on this based on the three things. One is that, that it has emotion itself. And then secondly is that it is going to be more inquisitive that is being more proactive. And thirdly, is, it's more than proactive. It's like, um, you, know, I, you know, there are a lot of uh, virtual girlfriends and virtual boyfriends on the internet with AIs, right? So I think the most important thing is uh, I have to dig in myself and try to memorize, try to remember what was the feeling. <laughs> <laughs> of a boyfriend and a girlfriend, <laughs> so that in to be able to incorporate the programming into the AI to have this feeling. Yeah, so, so we are working on that. <laughs> and uh, we, have, we don't have any time left, so thank you very much, Mohammed, Jerome, and uh, Hashki, and, uh, and everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, guys.